Welcome to GovCast, connecting with federal IT's top decision makers. I'm Alexander Bolova, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research. With me today is managing editor, Ross John Fortune. Hi, Ross. Hello. So you had the opportunity to chat with Testa Blanc Knowles, special assistant to the Director for Artificial Intelligence at NSF, the National Science Foundation. How'd it go? It was great. She recently got promoted, I guess. Appointed would be the proper term, I guess. But either way, it was she's now doing two things at NSF. She's doing, as you mentioned, the AI position, particularly dealing with the director and sort of being one of the overseers of the NAIR, the National AI Research Resource. But she's also doing the strategic advisor for technology policy and strategy at the Directorate for Technology Innovation and Partnerships. And the word partnerships is obviously a key thing for those who are not well-versed in NSF and its mission, because NSF is not necessarily this uh, regulatory agency or an agency that's doing a lot of implementation or anything. It's really doing a lot of partnering and a lot of research and bringing people together and bringing organizations together. So we talked a lot about that, about how to get everybody pulling on the same rope uh, when it comes to AI research and being a global leader in AI here in the States. And before we jump into your conversation, is there anything that you want to pick out to highlight that people should keep in mind as they listen? Well, I mentioned the the fact that we talked about the United States being a global leader in AI. Something that I've been, I'm going to be tracking a lot this year is the great power competition in AI uh, when it comes to the U.S. versus China versus the EU, all the different players in this space and how that can be something that the NSF is really involved in and Tess really, because of her IR background, she's worked in different international relations organizations and worlds before she pivoted to AI and, and science research. She had some really insightful things to say about that. Well, let's not keep our listeners waiting. Let's take a listen to your conversation. In December, the National Science Foundation announced the appointment of Tess de Blanc Knowles to the position of Special Assistant to the Director for Artificial Intelligence. Now, in this new position, she'll serve as the lead in the Office of the Director for issues related to AI and the National Science Foundation's implementation of the White House Executive Order on AI, and she'll also serve as a member of the NSF leadership team. Tess, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So this new role... What is it going to entail and how will or won't it affect your job that you also have as a strategic advisor for technology at the Directorate for Technology Innovation and Partnerships? Yeah, it's one of those classic um, dual hat scenarios. But uh, my role as special assistant to the director for AI is really focused on coordinating the many efforts that we have underway across the foundation that are supporting um, America's AI research and education communities, as well as, as you said in the introduction, ensuring timely implementation of the tasks that NSF was given responsibility for in the recent AI executive order. And, and in that order, there, there are a handful of tasks that are designated to um, NSF that are very much in line with kind of our traditional role in supporting the um, AI research ecosystem in America. And, you know, I want to note that NSF plays a really important role and significant role in sustaining AI research in America um, and has done so for decades. And, and you know, it was NSF's investments that were really instrumental in creating the deep learning and reinforcement learning approaches that are you know, at the core of today's large language models. And you know, just last year alone, uh, we invested 800 million um, in uh, AI research education and infrastructure, and that uh, spans across um, all 50 states um, and territories. And, you know, it used to be the case that um, our funding for AI research was primarily out of our computer science directorate, but now it's increasingly being funded um, across our eight directorates. And I think that that, that reflects this growing importance um, in terms of the application of AI um, across domains of science and engineering. And for, for um, those who are not familiar with NSF, those eight directorates um, each focus on an area of science or engineering. And then our new technology innovation and partnerships director focuses on translating research into practice across a, a subset of critical technology um, areas. Um, so, you know, 
going forward, NSF has this like really critical role um, to play in the future of AI in America in terms of you know, supporting the work that's going to develop new approaches to AI that I think are going to unlock, you know, the really critical capabilities that we want to see to come from the technology. Um, you know, we're really focused on broadening access to AI resources, um, like our recent launch at the National AI Research Resource Pilot. Um, and then we're pushing forward on kind of really just the probably the most important work right now in terms of advancing the trustworthiness and reliability of AI systems so we can un unlock all those benefits. And then we're developing the next generation of AI researchers, AI workers. We're going to kind of fill all of the jobs that are going to um, open up across domains. And so I feel really excited that, you know, I have this responsibility to help bring together kind of coordinated efforts across uh, the foundation, across those eight directorates um, to make sure that we're maximizing our impact across all of those lines of effort. And, you know, as I do so, I'm going to be working in really close coordination um, with our recently named Chief AI Officer, uh, Dorothy Aronson. She's in the um, Chief Information Officers Directorate, um, and she is really focused on our internal use of AI and how we can kind of do so responsibly to maximize our ability to, to meet our mission. This was another area of focus um, in the AI executive order in terms of, you know, encouraging agencies to think through um, how to adopt AI to kind of meet missions that, uh, you know, more effectively and kind of serve the broader public. Um, so we'll be working in close coordination. She kind of takes that internal lens and I kind of look externally um, at the research and education community. Well, speaking of the research and education community, you know, we're recording this about a week after the pilot launch of the National AI Research and Resource, the NAIR, such as it were or as it's called. And you know what, you and other officials have, have expressed that the um, National Science Foundation hopes to bring in more partners on board after the initial launch and bring in more people. What does that look like? And, and what is the future of NAIR within that context? Yeah, and that's a great question. You know, currently the NAIR pilot is bringing together contributed resources from 11 federal agencies, that's including NSF, and then 25 um, private sector and nonprofit and philanthropic organizations. And, and what are those resources that are being brought to the table are um, computational resources. So both kind of um, cloud computing and high performance computing resources, data sets, software access to both um, open models as well as proprietary models, um, and then training resources to really help with um, AI education. And so um, we, we launched this pilot um, just last week, it seems like longer. And, and it launched with kind of initial um, opportunity for researchers to apply for access to high performance computing uh, provided by the National Science Foundation and Department of Energy. And moving forward, um, we're gonna be um, making that kind of full suite of contributed resources um, for both agency and non-governmental partners available um, to the research community and focused on advancing uh, work that is um, in the space of trustworthy and responsible AI, as well as um, applied AI in the fields like healthcare, um, environment sustainability, um, and then supporting um, AI training and education. And so we kind of launched with this initial group of partners, um, but are really eager to continue to bring on partners as we move forward. Because as we see it, um, essentially, the more partners that we bring on board, um, the more resources we have to provide to the research community that's so hungry um, for these resources. And it, we can really enable so much more work along you know, those three uh, or four initial focus areas and potentially more um, as we bring more partners on board. And so we really see our ability to bring partners in and forge these partnerships as we're willing to extend the reach and the impact that we're going to achieve through the pilot. Well, partnerships are not always easy. You know, you've got a lot of partnerships uh, involved with an air pilot and bringing more in, but some of those partners' interests may not all be in line with one another. There may be competing interests. So how do you get all these industry, government agency, academic, nonprofit, how do you get all these partners all pulling on the same rope, all moving in the same direction? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think that, you know, in the case of the NAIR pilot, we're lucky in a way that um, we're served by the fact that really all of the participating organizations are like driven by the shared priority of strengthening the AI research community um, and the ability of more American researchers to participate in advancing AI and applying AI. 
Um, so it's very much a mission driven effort, which I think helps, um, you know, focus these combined efforts on on these kind of outcomes that we all want to see achieved. Um, and, and, you know, I really think that this this um, shared mission was demonstrated in really the speed that we were able to bring all these partners together. We got a, a 90 day deadline um, in the executive order and, and managed to bring um, all these partners on board with really some impressive contributions that are going to um, be really impactful um, to the AI research community. And so I think that we can continue to leverage this, um, uh, you know, mission um, and, and shared vision um, as we move forward in terms of um, connecting the research community with these resources, um, you know, through a, a lightly integrated process. And, and maybe Ross, I should mention, you know, the NAIR is, is kind of a first step in a proof of concept. Uh, it's the NAIR pilot is a, uh, a first step in proof of concept for this broader NAIR vision, which will be a much more um, kind of integrated national infrastructure that um, uh, connects researchers to federated resources um, across that breadth of research, uh, resources that I talked about for the pilot. And so the pilot is, is very much kind of a, an initial step towards that. So we're not gonna do the formal integration uh, behind um, at the technical layer among all the, the various resources that are being provided. Um, so I think that enables us to be a little bit more nimble uh, and move quickly in terms of, you know, bringing everyone together around the shared mission and then writing a, a, a review and matching process um, to really match the researchers with the resources that are going to best serve um, their efforts. I want to go back a second just because you mentioned this in this answer. The 90-day timeline from the executive order signing to the launch of the NAIR pilot. I remember going to a reporter's breakfast in Alexandria, where I saw you and some of your colleagues talking about the pilot. And my immediate thought was, that's a really compressed timeline. How much stress sort of was brought on? And what was it like inside that standing up in the ways that everyone in NSF was making it happen? Yeah. And I'll say also, it was 90 days with two major holidays thrown in there. So there was this, you know, added challenges. Um, but it was really, I think, impressive to see the folks at NSF just really come together and say, we have this mandate, we have this mission, we're going to sprint towards it. We were also served by the fact that, you know, this concept for the NAIR has, has been around for a while. Um, so the um, NAIR task force was um, mandated by Congress in the National AI Initiative Act of 2020. Um, and so that was a, a task force that brought together, co-chaired by NSF and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, that brought together um, experts from academia, from the government, from the private sector to build this concept for the NAIR. And, and their um, you know, final product was this imp detailed implementation plan, uh, which was released in January of 2023. So we had that kind of blueprint to work from um, of the work um, that the task force had done. And we also had this, you know, across many of the folks that we uh, approach to say, do you want to kind of partner in this effort, take this first step with us in the pilot? Lots of folks had a baseline understanding of the concept from the work that the NAIR task force had done and from the report itself. And so I think we were really served by kind of having this warm start. Um, and we'd had, you know, kind of ever since the task force released their report in January, there had been ongoing interagency conversations and working groups around how could we start to realize this vision? And so we had that kind of great starting point in terms of implementation plan, some initial conversations uh, that we could move out quickly from once we got that 90 day deadline. Yeah, I didn't even think about the uh, the holidays, but yeah, certainly the, the foundation is there. You know, certainly these, this was not something that was just out of the ether uh, for sure. Now, I want to talk a little bit about ethical AI and, and the responsible AI development and things like that. I've been to a lot of uh, AI events and things like that, including some that involved uh, the Defense Department who've talked about the sort of soft power nature of uh, the U.S. being at the forefront of AI development. You've worked in the defense and the IR world. How do you sort of see that both inside NSF and with your previous experience as far as the United States being a leader in bringing forward ethical AI and leading the way? Yeah, um, and I think I think that's critical, and I think that's one of the driving forces um, behind um, the need for the U.S. to continue to lead on the technical side. 
is that you know we bring to technical development our principles. Um, and, and, you know, Arthi Prabhakar, the director of OCP, often says, we talk so much about the technology, but humans are the ones creating it, right? And we are making the decisions around what to create, how to deploy it, um, how to structure it, what, what benchmarks and kind of guardrails to build in. And so I think on the soft power side of things, it's really critical for the U.S. to be out there leading in the development of technology and then doing so in a way that really kind of matches with our democratic values in terms of where we build the technology and then in how we deploy the technology. And then that kind of ties into kind of broader international conversations um, that, that the U.S. is, is um, you know, having a leadership role in, in terms of can we develop kind of common terminology around uh, what makes AI safe, secure, and trustworthy. Um, and, you know, we can more easily play a leadership role in those conversations if, if we're leading on the technical front as we are now. And I'll say one other thing kind of from the perspective of how the research environment plays into kind of broader national security. And this played a lot into kind of my personal pivot from a national security beginning um, into kind of a um, focus on, on research and AI research is that, you know, from my perspective, we can't have that, that national security position, a strong um, national security profile if we don't have a strong innovation environment. That is absolutely the foundational element um, to what we do. It drives economic growth. It drives the kind of baseline capabilities that then our national security organizations benefit from. Uh, but it's really kind of this foundational layer that that's kind of critical uh, for the nation as we move forward. It's a different track, but the thing I always think about is the Internet Speaks American that sort of catchphrase, I think that does speak a lot to the soft power of DARPAnet and, and development of the internet over this time. You've been in the AI world for, you know, you mentioned when, this pivot. I, I've asked other uh, AI folks about this. What do you say to the people who are kind of afraid of it and the hesitance and those things? You know, how do you uh, have those conversations as someone really, really in the inside? Yeah. And, and I think that's a, it's a really good question. And you know, kind of what I say to folks who, who are maybe hesitant about AI is talking about kind of the holistic approach that that we're taking in the US in terms of, you know, talking from my perspective about what are the opportunities I'm so excited about that I think AI will unlock. Um, and a lot of that is around um, you know, AI for the public good, like the ability of AI to really supercharge our scientific discovery process in terms of, you know being able to develop you know, novel drug therapies, um, personalized medicine, um, you know, accelerated development of new materials, AI plus biotechnology in terms of really pushing forward on, on sustainability and new processes. And I just think that the possibilities there are um, tremendous. But at the same time, in order to unlock those possibilities, we do need to move forward to make our current systems more trustworthy and reliable um, so that, you know, it's the same case that, you know, um, a consumer in the marketplace wants to be able to trust the output of their AI system. A scientist needs to be able to trust the output of the AI system in order to kind of really unlock all those possibilities that, that I'm so excited about. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of clear eyed in terms of we need to move forward to kind of make these systems more robust uh, for all the uses that we want. But we need to do that on the same time as kind of investing in the innovation portion of it so that we're unlocking the good that can come from AI at the same time. Of course, the last thing you want to have is something that uh, gets away from you, such as it were, again, technology that can be always a concern. And I know it can also be a real uh, opportunity. Continue to watch this space. There's so much happening. And there's, I think, a lot of potential uh, for, for NSF to really play a a positive role in, in kind of laying the foundation for this responsible AI future. So I hope that we'll kind of, you know, you'll continue to see from NSF the exciting ways um, that we're investing in AI research and, and particularly AI education as we're moving forward. Yeah, for sure. I know a, lot, a big part of the, the NAIR pilot is making AI accessible to, you know, researchers who maybe haven't had access before and, uh, that kind of education and, and usage is, is exceptionally valuable as far as unlocking the whole of the uh, of uh, the research world. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of our goals is so, you know, to really make it so that the the AI research community reflects the diversity of America itself and and, and really kind of equipping our um, you know, full 
tool nation for the, with the AI skills um, that are needed for the future. Certainly a, a, uh, a valuable goal and one uh, which we will certainly be watching. Thanks so much for being on the show with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. That was a fascinating conversation with Testa Blanc Knowles. Before we let our listeners go, are there any last highlights or takeaways that you want to leave them with? If they're interested in AI, of course, they can contact NSF to get involved with NAIR and uh, you know really see how the pilot is expanding access to AI research really to everyone, which has been a very big part of uh, the last few years in the science world is to make STEM and, and obviously AI being the, the hot thing now available to not just a select group of people. Well, thank you again, Ross. Listeners may notice that the title of this podcast feed has changed, and that's because we are putting all of our shows into this one feed, GovCIO Media and Research Podcasts. So if you're already subscribed here, you're going to be receiving not only GovCast, but our HealthCast and CyberCast shows as well. And we hope that you enjoy the extra content now in one convenient location. If you like what you heard, make sure that you leave a review and a five-star rating on the podcast platform of your choice. And hey, tell a friend. We always appreciate growing our audience, especially as we are trying to spread the word about our new podcast feed. Thank you all for listening. I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Ross Tronfortune. Thank you for listening. GovCast, along with HealthCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. To explore our content, visit our website, govciomedia.com. Keep an eye out for new episodes every Tuesday. And if you like what you heard, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Have a topic you want us to discuss? Contact us at newsletter at govcio.com. <laughs>